Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Help the Helpers. Hi. 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 Good to see everybody. Um, today is a, a day, a, a special day for us to get together when we really need to, um, to get together. We really need to be with each other. We really need to support each other. Um, and uh, Liz Baring reminded me that, that uh, Liz, would you say something about this holiday? Just that the few words you said before. Yes, I, um, today is uh, the 11th of November is Veterans Day in the United Kingdom. And my parents, I mean, I grew up in Argentina and both my parents were uh, in the war. So the British community used to get together and fundraise selling poppies and they called it Poppy Day. And I remember my, my the five-year-old there at this huge gathering and everybody singing God Save the Queen and my mother's crying and I don't understand what's going on. But the 11th of November always reminds me of the fundraiser for people in the Second World War. Yeah. My symbolic. Yes. yes, yes. So it's Poppy Day. Yeah. It's the meeting after our election in the U.S. And I would like today to be a coming out party. Do you feel like coming out? Anybody want? to come out. Um, I'm, I'm joking and not. Um, I, I would like us to really um, put the community empowerment projects on, on the map today. I'd like us to, to um, bring them much more into the world. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. Um, first, I should say, I'm I'm uh, very happy to be with you, and I'm just getting my feet on the ground from coming back from Rome, getting COVID on the plane, and uh, and sort of everything being very very up in the air. And I think that this meeting will will ground me, and I'm hoping it will. Around you. So, um, I did. I did a, a dialogue with Greg Madison on on Friday, and um, we were talking about my uh, my participation in the conference in Rome, and I was representing our community empowerment projects and talking about revolutionary listening and and forming um, a global empathic frame rather than the way that we think of an empathic frame in therapy with the dyad. We need this to be in, in the world. And what uh, what Greg and I uh, talked about is that uh, we have two amazing transformative practices that Jean Genlin gave us. We have the practice of focusing, which really gives us access to the more of us, to the embodiment of all that's in that um, that that deeper part of us that goes way out into the world and into the past and into the future. And we have the practice of listening, which I called revolutionary listening, of listening not just to the words, but to the music, listening not just to the content, but to 
the deeper point where the person is going that they may not even know they're going there, right? The to the to what's trying to be born in that person. And we need a lot more about revolutionary listening. But there is a third practice that Jean didn't give us. And the coming out party is the coming out party for this practice. And we may call this practice just simply relating or embodied relating or focusing oriented relating, although I think that narrows it too much. But Jean, as we know, uh, was very wary of groups, and for, for good reason. Groupthink can be very, very dangerous. And it's, it's a power that is unpredictable, in a sense. You know, Jean talked about how, as a little boy, his father went to a conference and and out the window in Vienna were all of these flags and signs um, affirming um, affirming Vienna and affirming um, affirming the homeland. And then when the father was coming back from um, from this conference, there were all the Heil Hitler and the flags for Hitler out the window. And, and that was in the course of an evening. And so Jean um, dedicated his, his life to really prizing the mystery and power of the individual and recognizing that the individual is a forward movement. There may be some blockages that we have to deal with, but given um, given real listening to the depths of, of that person, even when they aren't trying to express their depth, it's coming out, that that, that, that unleashes a forward movement. And we, we know that in our partnerships, and we know that in therapy. But what Jean didn't um, explore, really, is how we relate to each other when we're not in dyads, when we're not in therapy, when we're not in a focusing partnership. And God, our world depends on that the polarization and the um, the non-communication in our world is, is astounding. And so we desperately need a practice of relating. And I'm hoping to, to bring that, um, to, to share that with you. And you've heard me talk a lot about relating, really. Um, but I'm I, I'm also wanting you to carry it forward, to think about it, to help me with it, and and many of you are. Um, and um, so I want to sort of recap a little bit about my thinking about it and our thinking about it. Those in my class and my community empowerment group who are trying to think about it. It's, it's something that I learn about every day. And I've been doing this community empowerment uh, work since 2016. And I still feel like, oh, there's so much to learn about it before we actually put it into the world. But I think that that's like focusing. That there's more and more and more that you that you learn each time that you 
approach it. So um, I'm not going to wait to learn more. But um, but I would like to say I, I, I learned a lot of uh, uh, doing the, the workshop for the conference in Rome. And I'll tell you some of the things that I learned in, in presenting it there. So let's take a breath together. Just want to describe to you a few of the principles of community empowerment project, or as Greg Madison calls it, and he's working on the we're we're working on very similar things. In, he calls it embodied democracy. Mm-hmm. And then I'd like us to to to. Um, to do it, do this practice together. And I would like to ask you, and I'm going to ask you now, and you'll say, oh, I don't think so. But maybe at the end, you might say, oh, okay. I'd like to ask you, each of you, to have to host a community empowerment group of just four or five people, your neighbors, colleagues, friends. And I'm going to I'm going to suggest a structure for these groups. And and I'd like to ask you to do six sessions of those groups and then see if any of the people in your group would do a group with their friends, a a group practicing relating. So um, I've kind of developed three different models. And you are one model, right? The help the helpers. And that's a wonderful model for community empowerment. We get together every week. Everybody and anybody is invited. You don't have to know focusing to come. We have some kind of presentation. We have discussion. We've learned over the years so much more about discussing and expressing. And uh, and then we have uh, breakout rooms and then more discussion. And I think that's a wonderful model. So you might, you could use that model if you want to. The other model that I developed early on, and um, Liz and and Jim are part of this, is our generate group. And that's a neighborhood group in which we uh, emphasize talking uh, across generations, the younger people and the older people, and the people in the middle. And we talk about everything. Um, that, that was what our flyer said, conversation about everything. And we're, we're having a community, uh, a Generate meeting this coming Thursday. If any of you are in the New York or can get there um, at 7 o'clock on Thursday evening. So that's an in-person, uh, an in-person meeting. So... What do we mean by community empowerment or embodied democracy? One of the things that we know that we mean is bringing the philosophy and the skills from focusing into community, into families, into groups, into the more than two and I, and I think you may have noticed that we go from one, and it's a big leap to go from focusing to two and to listening, listening to ourselves and listening to the other. But then when we go to more than two, it's a huge leap. And that's the part that we don't know yet. How do we relate to each other 
in such a way that people can find that more and can find that momentum of life in them when we have more than two and maybe even more than three and we're in communities and meetings and neighborhoods and that's what our community empowerment is is trying to do so just a few principles of it that i brought to rome this is one of these are of the kinds of things that i wanted to share with my my international colleagues there psychoanalytic colleagues um that the first step is making room to everybody including the people that you disagree with including the people that you find annoying including the people that you find trying that we need everybody that we need all the voices and there's there's often um and this i just learned often sort of two phases of a uh, community empowerment group one phase is just making room for everybody and we've we've done that very well in this group the other phase is the second phase is more engaging with people i call that the you and me of relating how you are impacting on me how i'm feeling about you in the practices that jean gave us we know about the going inside and the embodiment and we know something about listening but what we don't know that jean didn't tell us he gave us a few hints in that article fitting in pouring out and relating is is speaking right relating has to do with speaking not just going inside not just listening not just responding but speaking and you uh i'm very grateful to you helped me to formulate how i how i say it and if you were there at that meeting this will be familiar to you it's a practice of speaking up when something comes to you when you feel in your body yes i need to say this speaking from this felt sense speaking to the others speaking to the group speaking to people in the group instead of and you gave me this phrase instead of speaking at right and that and that's a big part of of the community empowerment project is for us to learn to speak to rather than speaking at and we can do that so much better when we're speaking from I'm, I'm pointing but um you're not seeing me so uh and then speaking for what you believe in uh and speaking with the others so you're not lecturing the people or um or teaching them you are speaking with them as a witness and and that brings me to to another important aspect of of these groups and that is that it's it's non-authoritarian that doesn't mean that we don't have leaders we're hoping to have more and more leaders and i don't want to shy away from being a leader it's very important that we have leaders but the leaders aren't um the leaders aren't making the rules 
the leaders aren't requiring anything. The leaders are helping to give to 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 give power to the group, right? It's power with, not power over. And so we shy away from the kind of hierarchies where there are some people that are in and some people that are out, that where there are rules. And if you don't follow those rules, either implicit rules or explicit rules, then you don't belong. So that speaking with is very important and that non-authoritarian spirit is very important. There was something else I wanted to say about that. It will come back to me. Oh, uh, I know, I know what it is. Um, that going going from the structure of taking turns, which was in the consciousness raising group groups in the seventies and very, very powerful. And it's a wonderful scaffold, you know, structure to begin with. Going from that to how do we relate to each other when we're not taking turns is a very, very big leap. And this idea of knowing when to speak, how to speak, how to speak briefly, how to speak just one thing so that people can catch that and go further with it. This speaking with is, um, and I always laugh at myself for this metaphor because I know nothing about sports, but speaking with is like a ball game and um and there can't be too many balls in the air so we have to we have to catch the balls as they come the balls with it and then the balls between us and um rather than reflecting only which is what we know from our listening practice so far where we reflect what the person is getting at. And we want to do that in community. But there's also something about just catching the ball that the person has thrown. And even just saying, I got it, or or uh something with these little <laughs> with with these with these little things that I've been learning <laughs> helps. Oh, wait a minute. We, we, we want to do this one. Um, it's catching the ball that the other person has thrown. So it's, it's, it's about uh, not necessarily helping the other person to go deeper. Sometimes it is. But sometimes it's just, it's, it's about receiving their contribution in this game, in this um, in this play that we're doing, um, where we're making something together. It's. It, uh, I think a couple of you may have been with me when I've done uh, art art openings and I include a, an experiential part and we have a great big paper and everybody makes marks and uh, and we have some fun usually about people making marks over the marks other people made and, and do you have your own territory or do you use the whole sheet? And, uh, and after we make all those marks, then we use stencils and then we take a um, uh, very watery paint and and uh, and make uh, glazes over it. And by the end of all of these different layers, we have a beautiful piece that you would be amazed about. 
And I, I think some of you have seen that. And that's sort of what uh, community empowerment or real relating is, where we're not each making our own picture, but we're contributing our um, our spontaneous um, gesture, what comes to us, and then all of us are making it together. And that's the part that's that's really um, difficult to, to put into words and, and to practice. Um, um, the other the other thing that I want to say is in this speaking is the prizing of diversity not only putting up with it, and we do have to put up with it sometimes, but knowing that it's going to lead to something unexpected. It's this courting surprise. Somebody says something like, wow, they said that? What does, what does that mean? Where does that come from? And that receptiveness, which is in the focusing attitude, of really wanting a group that isn't like-minded. We want to see the differences and the, uh, and the mystery of each different mind that's coming together as we are this interaction. I have lots more to say, but I think that the the main thing that I want to say is that we're trying an evolutionary step, I, as I see it, of replacing rules of behavior, which we've always relied on in relating throughout history. And we're replacing that with um, shared leadership and coming from the felt sense. And that's a very, very big step. And we're trying to practice that step. Can we be a self-generating system? Can we be a system that finds its equilibrium from the focusing attitude and the felt sense. So I'm going to stop here, and and I want to hear anything you have to say, and and I'm going to suggest uh, a scaffold, a practice, and we can try it in um, in our breakout rooms, or we may not have a chance to try it today because we may be doing our whole group discussion today but uh but i will uh send it to you and and or tell it to you and see if you can try it out we'll see okay i've talked too much let's hear from you Yeah, I have a question after re I just kind of went through the um, handout. Yeah. So my question would be, what, what do you say, how do you introduce, uh, would you like to be part of a group, the purpose of which is blank? <laughs> the purpose of which is um, it depends on the people, but the purpose of which is to study relating. To study how we relate. To learn to relate um, better. <laughs> to be, I mean, the, the purpose of which, oh, I'm, I'm now I'm remembering, Liz, because you said that, what I wanted to say before. Um, <clears throat> the the purpose of which 
is to be the kind of creatures that we're meant to be, which are pack animals, right? We're, we're meant to be these, uh, we're meant to be in groups. We're not really meant to be isolated creatures. Um, what I wanted to say was that that Jean knew so well about um, about the need to be listened to. And he would say, everybody, no matter who it is, becomes beautiful when they're listened to. And I always loved that. I always wanted to challenge him. Well, if you listen to Hitler, would he become beautiful or something? But I love that. But what Jean didn't uh, know about or talk about or carry forward is the basic human need to belong. And that's so motivating. You know, when you, if you start a group, if you're willing to start a group and to meet with them for six sessions, it catches holes and people really care within the first few minutes. It's so amazing. It's, it's like something gets, gets hooked in to I want to belong or I want people to like me or I don't want people to exclude me or I, I want to count here or I want my words to, to land. I want someone to catch my ball. Um, so that, that need for belonging is what we're, we're, um, what we're spelling out and what we're practicing. How do we belong? How do we belong without rules? How do we belong without having a culture of repression where you wouldn't dare say this or that part of yourself? So you're inviting people for a practice group, practice of relating, where we're all learning together. I'd love to say something in response to that. Please. Um, what was just coming to me was um, some videos I've seen of people, I guess just catching the spirit of the moment. <laughs> There's some, some videos of people I've seen talking about their experience of being in the MAGA community um, before coming out of it. And, and 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 talking about what a strong sense of community they had and how important that was to them. And then the moment where um where they saw something in a way that diverged from that that mainstream cultural belief system and, and how they experienced themselves being quite violently rejected. And that was a real wake-up call for them. Yes. But I did think, okay, um, that I think there's a huge underestimation, um, which is, I think, what really what you're saying is so much speaking to of how much uh, so many of us are missing that feeling of belonging in a very deep way to a, to a sort of everyday lived community. Yes. Oh, thank you, Lucy. That that was beautifully said. And all of us have known that, I think, or known people who've experienced that. In in as a as a teenager, I was a part of a fundamentalist church, and there was a wonderful feeling of belonging. But then uh, when I went to college and I started having other uh, input and other beliefs, I couldn't bring them into that community. And yeah. I think so many people have had the experience uh, that belonging goes with sameness. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Liz, you uh, you talk about saming <laughs> rather than othering. Othering and saming sort of have the same purpose. It's like we can only belong 
if we're within this small container. And so the practice of relating that comes from um, the openness and curiosity is that we can belong and talk across difference and welcome the difference. And that's very, very rare. I haven't seen it in the political groups that I've worked with. You know, those groups would break down because of difference and split off, couldn't navigate difference. I guess it's a principle of inclusion there, but it's inclusion inclusion of all the differences and learning from them, not agreeing. It's not about agreeing or condoning or anything. It's about it's about hearing. Um it's yeah. okay to speak? Please. This is the speaking time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what are we be- what are we belonging to? And how does belonging uh, across differences really happen? Because inclusion is is a very tough thing when there are very uh, profound, uh, Absolutely. differences in value in in what is of matter um right so that uh you know how do we create a belongingness to or or, or help people to move into you know if we talk about well i belong as a fractal of the one, you know, yes, or, yes. Or, uh, or I belong because I'm a human being. Right, um, exactly. How do we work with that? that that's a real question. I, because belonging right, right. is so much about, yeah, I belong to this because I'm not part of right, that. Right, right, right. And so in, this in, is what we're talking oppositionality, really. Yes, of course. Um, I think the other thing is um, the struggle. I've been in a particular group for several years now of study and uh, watching my own reactiveness to, oh, she's so boring. How can one say that? My own impatience with what's going on. Um, So much of the group at least for me, I've been learning, is about dealing with my own um, my own judgments and reactiveness. Um, yes. Ruth. And how do we do that um, and really face that in ourselves and help others to do that too? So those are just my thoughts on, you know, my struggles with this. Yes, yes, yes. And you're helping to develop this practice of relating. You know, it's it's all of us, I think, are working on this in our own way. We're working on this basic human need for belonging as a human being. I mean, when you see a, a, a doggy day camp or something like that, and these dogs that don't know each other, they just romp and play and and they don't ask why do we do we belong, don't we belong? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think by by nature we are like that or like dolphins or like, you know, that we belong because we are human. And we have to claim our belonging. I I always say that uh, belonging isn't something somebody gives you or you have because this or that. It's something that we claim that we belong. And then that introspection of leaving room for pauses so we can say, what does that mean to me? And in in, uh, my group class, Mikhail 
brings that in quite a bit. What what does it mean to me? How am I um, struck by this? Now, I uh, do do let let's have just one more comment. We haven't I actually this relating, but we have been yeah, doing. Uh, well, of course, the whole whole thing of non nonverbal communication, of course, how to how to listen to the needs past uh, past the jackal to the need underlying what the person is saying so not to relate so much to what's in their head but what's in their heart not with ourselves as well of course because we respond with our jackals and judges and not so much for but i i really i just somebody posted i think it was on facebook a quote from Thich Nhat han that i've been really enjoy what she says Peace is a practice, not a Say we that. practice peace. We have to be peace. We don't, we don't, it's I, not like we. Yes. I love that. Yeah. We got it. Right. Be peace. Uh, there be is peace. a way to peace. Peace is the way. And be peace. peace. But, right. but I think that a step further is the practicing peace and relating because we can practice peace by uh, not hurting people. But the, the practicing relating is by nature kind of messy at yeah. point. Um, I think that that uh true we, and how do we stay uh, in that quality of presence and listening so that we we actually <laughs> if i'm breaking up that's okay I, i'll stop yes you're breaking up i i, I yeah. will stop i'll stop this this is uh this is an instance really of uh of how relating is messy, how we have to keep trying over and over to throw our balls and catch, right? Uh, I am going. I, I just want to, I uh, kind of maybe just brought uh, uh, Charles in. Um, it's kind of like I just want to save, uh, break my own silence. Good. Uh, I'm not sure if it is good because I think it's that breaking the resonance of of um, makes me a dissonant voice. Then you know uh, this just kind of scares the bejesus out of me because it sounds so reasonable, and I don't have the words. And because I don't need to fight, I already belong in a world you know that's full of diversity. Um, but I can't quite get a handle on why it scares the bejesus out of me, you know. I think it's because it's almost, uh, it's because it's a model that I, I grew up with and it's a culture, you know, uh, and a culture of compliance um, because we are different, you know, we're all different. So the identity that I would want to have would be with relating to others, but it would be an intimacy and a commitment to friendship and uh, whatever. So I'd need to know because I already belong in a world that is diverse. So I suppose that's it. I can do that easily enough in a small group like this, um, but at a cost to myself because it's, it's a dissonance voice. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, but it's the intent that scares the bejesus out of me. It's like, what's going on that we have leaders, uh, we have nonviolent communication. But I do love the idea of community and practice, but not kind of sold to me uh, as if it was something that was revolutionary not. or evolutionary. So that's that's some cost to myself to say that because underneath that um, reasonable voice that I is there's a deep rage at being um, uh, at being uh, not being able to. Uh, understand where I came from. So that's my uh, voice, just to say hello. <laughs> so. 
Pauline, you're, you're an instance also, you know, of what we're talking about, that we need the dissonant voices. And well, I don't want to be a dissonant voice or I don't want to have to be an oppositional voice, you know. Uh, I have my own spiritual practice um, and that involves just my own kind of creativity, you know, my own mark in that. So I've no intention of uh, kind of becoming anything with discord you know it's just uh but it does come at some cost to to voice that and it is in a very safe place that i'm doing it because of my experience of this group that yeah. it is safe but it's still going it kicking against there's a good book uh, from one of our uh um, activists here uh, david norris he was the first man to bring the hum uh, gay rights to the European court. And um, he's a gay man and a senator. And yeah, at that stage in my lifetime, it was still um, a crime for him to be a gay man. But he wrote a book, A Kick Against the Pricks, you know. Oh, <laughs> I, think wow. it's a ca I think it's a Catholic uh, 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 reference in the Bible or something. So thank you. I just really wanted to really wade into that and, and take my place in that. And feel, I'm really grateful for feeling safe, that I won't be yes. punished. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I like that idea that you're taking your place. Let's see if we could all feel into that, taking our place, that we all have a place. And your voice, Pauline, is important to the whole, this terror of discord, the terror mm -hmm. of fighting. And it may sound like I'm asking you all to go into battle. Um, it's the fact, Lynn, that you'd be asking me to do anything would be yes. scaring me, you know, scaring Any us. Yeah. Yes, asking you to do anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I just got to mute myself now because I could, we could have this d discussion and that would be really relating. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you. Um, Hi. This, is, this is also, you know, part of it, right? Uh, Pauline and I were were speaking to each other. And now, how does that, what we were saying, impact you? What do you have to say there? Hi. I just ah, like to say hi. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, what's been going on for me as we're talking all morning is a sense of alienation that I feel now since the election. And um, there was a sense of community, of things coming together. And now I'm living with a sense of where am I in this country? Where are my people that I had felt connected to? And this sort of overpowering feeling that um, I'm not connecting to this government, this world, this country that I'm living in now. And um, it triggers a lot for me. Mm. So, I mean, we're talking about groups and community and connection. And now living in a country that I'm not sure where it's all going and the impact it will have on me. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons that... that uh, I wanted us to to really put this relating on the map is that that um, so many of us were blindsided about the the polarization that we know that we're a polarized country, but we're very, very polarized. And a practice of relating is is a kind of medicine to that polarization. I believe, and uh, that's why I'm I'm sort of encouraging people to get together with just a few other people, uh, and and try out a practice of relating, really receiving each person. I think what I'm going to do is ask you 
in the breakout rooms to try out this um, uh, this little structure, and maybe you'll come up with better structures. This is sort of like Jean's six steps of focusing, and I always hated the six steps. I don't like structures, but I'm 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 going to try it out with you, okay? And maybe you'll come come up with a a better one. But the one that, that I came up with that we can try in our breakout rooms is starting just with um, a centering. Everybody silently just going inside, finding your body, and then looking at the others on your screen that centering of the me and the me with you. And then, and we'll have groups of four, having each person, um, maybe we'll have groups of three or four, each person say something from, to speak from what's there for them. And the others will receive that, acknowledge that in some kind of way, might be just saying a word back, it might be doing these little things, these little hearts or question marks or something, but the others will receive it, but not take the space, to not take over it. And each person will go around like we did in consciousness raising groups, and then there's a pause of um, taking our breath and taking in the ingredients of the conversation and then relating to each other. This, this is what came up for me when I heard you say that. I loved what you said about such and such. I got scared when you said. So there are I statements that are... Um, part of the conversation from your feeling place and acknowledging others. And then just a few minutes of, of recapping. So could somebody put those in the chat? I'm going to say them again. Uh, and then we'll, we'll try it out. Who wants to do that? I could do it. Thank you. Um, so we're going to Center, have a go around. That includes brief reflection. Again, center, pause. We'll call the third one pause. And then have a conversation, a relating, speaking from, speaking to, speaking with. And then ending with just seeing how that was. I, I'm going to take this away from this. We, we may not have time for all of those, but we might. So we're going to have breakout rooms. I think we'll have breakout rooms of, of three, um, three or four. And we'll meet till, uh, till 9.30. And so you'll have um, just two or three minutes at the beginning for the go around, you know, and then pause and then relating. And then we'll give you a one minute warning or two minute warning to just sum up or recap or um, say how it was for you. Okay, we want to try that out. And and then we're going to see if you can come up with a scaffold. So in it, those of you who would do little groups, who could use a structure like this or your own, um, and 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 we can find together what's our best way. But we want to make the, this spontaneous conversation of relating. That's our goal. Okay. Um, 
Any questions about those instructions? We're playing together. We're experimenting. Okay, let's try it. I'll see you at, at 9.30. Welcome back, everyone. Oh, let's sorry. I didn't know I was muted. I was saying it's good to see you all, and I'd <laughs> love to hear how this practice of relating went. And I wonder if Incy had something to say or Bob. Uh, but I forgot that I had been muted. I had a fast trip to New York City. Outside <laughs> with the cars going by and horns. And it was just a really neat meeting with Incy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes. I'm, I'm sitting on my street. I'm sorry. My internet connection is very bad. So um, it's, uh, you, you, you heard Christopher Street. Thank you. Yeah. And we stayed grounded through it all. Your instructions were very good. <laughs> Thank you. Very I'm glad. Yeah, uh, let me say a word here just very briefly that I think we found the centering, the main important thing. Taking time to center is valuable for all three of us. Uh, in my group, uh, I said something and another member um, related to what I said from her own experience and that was very touching. We, we're learning from all these things that we're saying. Relating to another person's experience can be very touching. The centering is very important. We're always visiting another place. <laughs> A quick trip to New York. But we're, we're having quick trips to the other person's universe. Each person is a world of their own. In my group, there was some discussion of what about the opposites? You know, um, all the dogs get along in the doggy daycare. But what about the dog that doesn't get along? Mm -hmm. The dog that just wants to fight mm -hmm. was brought up. And um, one response I had was that one of my focusing partners is somebody I am politically on the opposite side of. But we don't relate on that level. We relate from a much deeper level because I know what's in his heart. He knows what's in mine. And that mm -hmm. supersedes everything political. Yes, yes. To know what's in the other person's heart. Sometimes I think that it can be very helpful to make the implicit explicit, you know, and that's what we know from focusing to name something. So it it might be a carrying forward if it's if it's right to say to the person, you know, I know we're where we think very differently politically, but I know what's in your heart and you know what's in my heart. And there's something about naming a conflict and giving it a container that sometimes can carry it forward. It's a kind of acknowledging that doesn't make the other person bad. Yes. We see the humanity in each other. Mm. And saying that is is a step in relating. But sometimes these conflicts are not really conflicts of ideas. They're conflicts of how are we going to carry something out in the world? And it can only be carried out in one way. Uh, and sometimes that way uh, means that one person gets what they get and the other does not get what they need. And maybe there's not enough to go around. And they have to be good with that, I imagine. Because mm. it's not, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to accept the theoretical conflict. I feel this way, you feel that way, as opposed to there's only 
one cookie and only one of us gets it and the other starves to death. Can I, can I say a word about that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. This is because our, because, we're because I think, I think, I think Jim is talking about strategies to meet needs. And he's saying that sometimes we can't find a strategy that meets all our needs, but that's exactly what we're trying to search for and spending time trying to find. We may not always succeed, but the whole goal is to find strategies that do, in fact, meet the needs. So when you say action, action is a strategy. And we can think about different actions that might, in fact, meet more people's needs, or maybe to some extent, to the extent to which we care about each other, we may adapt and be willing to accept strategies that we don't necessarily totally delight in. So I just want to open it up to saying that that we don't have to stay stuck on there's just this one strategy. I once said to Gina, I quoted something from NBC that for every need, there's 10,000 strategies and he, he liked that. So we need to keep looking for strategies that will meet both our needs, if possible. Not always possible. I agree with Jim on that. I wonder if relating, the practice of relating, which we're trying out in this evolutionary step, um, the relating across difference has a, a component about uh, strategizing about how we can take action together. But there might be preliminary um, relating that is free from the demand of taking action right away, of just really hearing each other. Sometimes the taking action, I think, is premature and and get stuck in the polarization. Yes, I agree. Yeah, good point. But at least I think it's okay. I think it's uh, a matter of being in a priv privileged position where you can take time to strategize and delay action. I think in a lot of the world, the actions aren't being taken quickly enough and people are in deep trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's an important point. Yeah. Um, as as Bob was talking, um, I'm I'm trying to like see how I can deal with um, having a daughter who's Latina and feeling so deeply rejected by what happened in the election um, and watching her reaction. Um, the depth of that feeling and how not for everybody in the Republican Party, for sure, but f for many, it just comes across with the language that is so deeply hurtful and exclusionary. Um, it was just very hard to sit with watching how viscerally how this viscerally hurt her and being with her because I was on a trip for 12 days with her. Um, I saw that how hard she was working not to let that eat her insides. But it was so strong that she made a decision not to go to Thanksgiving to her fiance's relatives because of their position on gay rights and transgender um, and some of the immigration policies. So I'm just dealing with that. Mm. It's the personalizing. It's like how from her mind, how can somebody vote a certain way? Um, it's just the sense of that penetrating rejection of who she is. 
Yes. Sometimes it feels as if we're asked to be saints. Yeah, that we always have to hear the other point of view. And we have to be the bigger person. And well, I, I think that we're not saying um, that we, we are saints or that there isn't a time when you need just to pour out, but making that pouring out safe. And if we think of relating as a practice, it's something that we don't know yet how to do, right? And it's something that we can't do all the time, but it's something that we can, we can deeply study and can be as important to us as focusing is. I think in our group, um, certainly what I felt was each person um, owning their own experience, even if it was difficult to hear. Mm. Um, I, I, each person saying, this is my experience, rather than blaming, mm -hmm. speaking in a blaming language. Mm -hmm. That made it so much, that made it feel so much safer, so much easier to listen. Mm. Yes. Sometimes we need to give ourselves empathy first. That's almost my response to this. We need to acknowledge how hard it is for us to hear something or how intense our reaction is. And, and we, if we don't do that, I have, uh, one of my NBC teachers said, we're giving empathy from hell. We're, we're trying to empathize from a place where we're feeling hell. And that doesn't work. We need to give ourselves enough empathy that we can really feel like or find somebody who can empathize with us before we can even begin to empathize with the other person. Mm. So it's none of us is a saint as far as I know. We all have our reactions. And we need to have compassion for ourselves as well. And then there's always the, the principle uh, that we know from therapy that uh, it's better it's in some way for there to be mistakes and then to repair them than there weren't repair. wasn't mistakes right it's mm -hmm. the uh what my we grow we grow more from that right the cleaning mm -hmm. up after yourself uh you can take risks when you when you can clean up after yourself and say wait i i didn't mean it the way it sounded there or uh, I did mean it the way it sounded, and and now I'm, I'm seeing how that landed on you, or something like that. I also, um, I think Jen Lynn in the little focusing book says something like, "You can't trust any one step of the body, but you can trust a series of steps." each step is the right step and it might not be where you land. You might go somewhere else eventually. Um, and I think if we can remember that we can trust that whatever's happening in the other person is their right next step for whatever reason. <laughs> yes. And that they're going somewhere. You don't have to like the weather as it is, but it will change if you really, if you really listen to it. Mm hmm. I just oh. want to say that I heard Dorothy's um, daughter's experience. It's very yeah. hard not to hear something and will I and not be touched by it. And especially when it becomes real with uh, in laws and that. And just the the roomy quote of beyond the field of right and wrong, there's the field. And I think that's the evolutionary step, and that it's in us all. <laughs> the capacity to self-soothe is in us all. So anyway, just lots of love, Dorothy, to your daughter. That's, that's a wonderful last remark. And uh, now we have Dorothy's poem. 
Um, this is a lovely poem called Begin by Jan Richardson. Um, you might remember it. We have read it before. Um, begin again to the summoning birds, to the sight of the light at the window. Begin to the roar of morning traffic all along Pembroke Road. Every beginning is a promise born in light and dying in dark, determination and exaltation of springtime, flowering the way to work. Begin to the pageant of queuing girls, the arrogant loneliness of swans in the canal, bridges linking the past and future, old friends passing, though with us still. Begin to the loneliness that cannot end, since it perhaps is what makes us begin. Begin to wonder at unknown faces, at crying birds in the sudden rain, at branches stark in the willing sunlight, at seagulls foraging for bread, at couples sharing a sunny secret, alone together while making good. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, something that will not acknowledge conclusion insists that we forever begin. Thank you. We'll for, forever begin. And um, anybody who would want to uh, do a little group of your own people, uh, write to me and tell me, and we'll see if we can give you some help with that. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Elvis. Yes, bye, and thanks. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Lynn.